Grant study to the second in a series of four Brannigan lectures, which are, we are having this year in honor of the 20th anniversary of the Institute. Established in the early 80s, the Institute has sought to provide a number of ways of facilitating faculty research and creative activity. In general, the production of knowledge on all eight campuses of the Indiana University system. We do this by inviting external fellows for periods of two or three weeks to collaborate or consult with faculty, by welcoming internal and external scholars into our community, by sponsoring a series of inter or transdisciplinary seminars. And on the Bloomington campus, we have these Brannigan lectures enabling faculty to hear and interact with scholars whose work defies disciplinary boundaries. In addition to tonight's Brannigan lecture, let me also tell you that our speaker will be giving a, a more informal presentation tomorrow evening at 7.30 in Valentine 004. The topic is Balzac's Cartographic Imagination. And then on Wednesday afternoon at 4.00, in the chemistry building 033, Possible Urban Worlds. The Brannigan lectures themselves are made possible by a generous bequest to the Institute through the IU Foundation from the estate of Jean Lois Porteous Brannigan, a graduate and a long supporter of Indiana University and its intellectual pursuits. We gratefully acknowledge that bequest. Tonight's Brannigan lecturer, David Harvey, is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, the Graduate Center, City University of New York. Educated at Cambridge, recipient of numerous awards, honors, and honorary degrees, Professor Harvey has written widely on geography and social theory, environment and social change, social justice, utopianism, and so on and so forth author of numerous books, including the 1973 Social Justice and the City, the widely read and translated 1989 The Condition of Postmodernity, the 1996 Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference, and more recently even Spaces of Hope, and more recently even, very shortly ago, Spaces of Capital Towards a Critical Geography. From a cursory exploration of his work, I have seen an amazing breadth of reference, crystalline prose, and provocative ideas, the uneven distribution of capital, the politics of culture, all of this grounded in what I would call an admirable specificity. I've actually been struck, too, with the degree of pertinence what I have read has to the current world situation. Let me cite, by way of introduction, several short passages from Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference. I quote, it is vital when encountering a serious problem, not merely to try to solve the problem in itself, but to confront and transform the processes that gave rise to the problem in the first place. Or, learning to see the world from multiple positions, if such an exercise is possible, then becomes a means to better understand how the world as a totality works. And finally, the security of places have been, has been threatened and the map of the world rejigged as part of a desperate speculative gamble to, to keep the accumulation of capital on track. Such loss of security promotes a search for alternatives, one of which lies in the creation of both imagined and tangible communities in place. The issue of how to create what sort of place becomes imperative for economic as well as political survival. I'm pleased indeed to welcome David Harvey and I anticipate his presentation, Geographical Knowledges and Political Power. It's uh, actually a very difficult moment to uh, uh, go around giving talks uh, as if uh, business is as usual. Uh, I moved to New York in August, uh, been there three weeks, and uh, uh, 
all kinds of traumatic things then happened. And I think many of us uh, are having uh, a difficult time coming to terms exactly with how to respond uh, to those events. Um, and each of us has uh, a certain kind of perspective that we would probably want to take and certain issues which uh, arise. In my own case, there's one issue that is relevant uh, to this evening, and it's uh, broadly this, that uh, for some time now I've been a rather strong critic of U.S. policy, commercial, political policy, in relationship to the rest of the world. Um, and uh, that criticism uh, has been fairly strongly articulated in a number of articles in a number of places. Uh, and I felt uh, very strongly, however, that the events of September the 11th were not in any way justified in relationship to those criticisms. But by the same token, I also feel uh, that the events of September the 11th uh, do not justify throwing away all of those criticisms as if uh, they were irrelevant, as if they didn't matter. In other words, I don't see that those events should in any way be used to justify the continuation of what I think are erroneous and seriously flawed policies and practices. Now, I don't want to go through a big catalogue of uh, my objections that would take rather a long time, but what I do want to say is that one of the hopes that I had had uh, after September the 11th was that at least there would be the possibility for some sort of dialogue and discussion uh, over how the U.S. positions itself in the world, what it does in the world, how it does it, and in, through that dialogue uh, actually maybe arrive at some reconstituted set of policies and practices. Unfortunately, that has been very difficult. We held, for example, a variety of teach-ins at CUNY, uh, only to find that these then got uh, really slagged off by the New York Post as being uh, sort of uh, America bashers in the midst of uh, this sort of uh, period of, uh, uh, of, of difficulty. We then found the uh, CUNY Board of Trustees was prepared to entertain uh, a motion condemning seditious practices uh, within the university system. And I actually for a while began to fear that uh, we were in for a new bout of McCarthyism where there was actually going to be suppression of uh, political discussion and political debate at the very moment when political discussion and political debate seemed to me to be absolutely essential if we were to come out of this uh, situation in a way that was better than how we went into it. Now, my own particular topic today is sort of tangentially relevant. Many of the things that I have thought about and, 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 and come to, to work upon uh, were really constructed before this uh, uh, last event, and I suppose uh, I should also entertain the idea that everything has changed uh, after September the 11th, but in certain respects I think that some of the argument that I want to make tonight has not been changed, and it may, I hope, be just a little bit relevant. Uh, to some of the issues that I think we confront. Now, I use the, the plural term geographical knowledge is uh, rather than the singular for a very, very specific reason. Actually, two reasons. The first is that I do have, and though my current position is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, I have had a long career in geography and continue to maintain uh, considerable uh, interest in uh, that specific discipline, but as a discipline, geography uh, is a little bit, uh, how should we say it, uh, all over the place. Uh, any discipline that uh, goes all the way from, say, paleoecology and uh, desert geomorphology through GIS and, and uh, remote sensing to uh, queer theory in the city and postmodern geography and all the rest of it, obviously any discipline that does that has some sort of identity problem. Uh, and, and therefore, I think it's better to think even about the discipline of geography as being constituted out of a multiplicity of knowledges rather than some clear essentialist definition. Uh, in the history of geography, there have been various attempts to come up with some essentialist definition of what is geography. Um, 
those attempts have always ended, and they've always ended badly. And I think that we should, uh, within the confines of that discipline, insofar as it's a discipline, recognize that there are multiple technologies at work and treat this as an advantage rather than as a problem. But there's a second reason, a much more powerful and important reason, and that is that geographical knowledges are uh, important all over the place. They occur everywhere. And I think there's only a very small part of the uh, corpus of information that you might put under the rubric of geographical knowledge is actually to be found within the discipline of geography. It is to be found uh, everywhere, and it's with that geographical knowledge which exists in general that I'm really concerned with uh, tonight. And here, too, I think it's wise to begin with the plurality of it, uh, the multidimensionality of it, in order to uh, sort of understand something uh, about uh, its structure, how it works. In short, what I'm interested in doing is looking at the way in which geographical knowledges are constructed in various ways, in various places, for various purposes, and how those knowledges actually work in society at large in relationship to the formu formulation and perpetuation of certain kinds of political power, and how a challenge to political power is often a matter of challenging the nature of the geographical knowledge which that power actually uh, presents uh, to the world. Now, <clears throat> part of the reason for this uh, is also another sense that most of the disciplinary boundaries which we have sort of grew up at the end of the 19th century and have been fixed in concrete ever since. And there's considerable stress around uh, the issue of knowledge production and disciplinary boundaries. And that stress, I think, uh, has been redoubled in the last, uh, say, 20, 30 years with the onset of this phenomena, which we generally lump together under the heading of globalization. Now, globalization is a sort of awkward term. In my view, it's been going on since 1492, if not before. Um, and there have been different phases of it. But I think we have to recognize that since 1970 or so, uh, there, have been, there has been a, a, a radical shift in the way in which globalization is working. I mean, there was a global system from 1945 to 1970 built around U.S. hegemony and military and, uh, and around the dollar and Bretton Woods and all those kinds of things. That all collapsed and it's been reconfigured. Uh, and it's been reconfigured largely around the idea of neoliberal, a neoliberal kind of project in which the market is seen as dominant and all you need are the institutions to allow the market to work and everything is going to be okay. So you have institutions like the WTO, uh, which are put in a hegemonic kind of position and you mediate it through that, then the market is going to uh, produce uh, uh, the benefit, uh, going to work to the benefit of, of all humanity. That is the nature of the argument. But plainly, there's something wrong with that and alongside of that has grown a lot of extensive literature about how to regulate neoliberalism on a global scale and in which ways to regulate it. And we've had arguments over sort of global environmental regulation. Uh, we've had uh, issues of, of conventions of, you know, a renewed interest in questions of human rights. Uh, we've had a whole set of uh, uh, questions around uh, labor standards, environmental standards, and all, all the rest of it, which are beginning to, and so, so a kind of question is, are there institutions of and, and uh, practices of world governance which can somehow or other deal with this neoliberal world and regulate it in ways that makes it uh, fairer and, uh, and, and less uh, unequal than it's turned out to be. Now, out of all of those sorts of ways of thinking, there's one way of thinking I want to look at just uh, very briefly. Uh, because uh, it just so happened I got interested in it largely for fortuitous uh, reasons, and that's the whole idea of uh, cosmopolitanism and the cosmopo sort of a cosmopolitan ethic, which many people are now proposing as one of the ethical bases for thinking about uh, issues of global, uh, global governance. And there's now an extensive literature on sort of cosmopolitanism and, uh, and, and, and the like, and what's interesting about it is that the beginning of the, of, of the 19th century to be called a cosmopolitan in Central Europe was to be lumped together with commies and Jews and all kinds of other people who were traitors to, to national interests. And, but now it's lost some of its negative connotations and is seen as a, 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 a sort of a positive uh, 
way of, uh, of trying to think through the issues of global responsibilities uh, in a situation where globalization has set up a whole set of, of particular kinds of problems and tensions. Now I'm going to take up one particular kind of uh, uh, argument here. One of, the, one of the people who's been most uh, avidly in favor of the cosmopolitan position is uh, Martha Nussbaum. And I want to, I'm going to quote something from Martha Nussbaum uh, just to give you an idea of where I want to go. She makes the argument in her fundamental law piece that created a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of discussion. Um, it, it, that the United States, she said, is unable to look at itself through the lens of the other, and as a consequence is equally ignorant of itself, precisely because the population is so appallingly ignorant of the rest of the world. Uh, this is uh, a sort of a, a sophisticated version of that question which has been lurking around since September the 11th uh, as to why is it that they dislike us so much. Um, her argument then follows, in order to conduct any adequate global dialogue, we need knowledge not only of the geography and ecology of other nations, something that would already entail much revision of our curricula, but also a great deal about their people, so that in talking with them we may be capable of respecting their traditions and commitments. Cosmopolitan education would supply the background necessary for this deliberation. Cosmopolitanism, she's arguing, is an empty ideal without a proper understanding of geography, of anthropology, uh, and, and history. Now, what was interesting in the debate that followed is that nobody actually sat down and said, well, what kind of geographical knowledge is she talking about? Nobody sat down and said, what kind of anthropology is she talking about? Or what kind of historical knowledge is she talking about? And that issue was generally left uh, on, on, on the side of the discussion and debate which struck me as rather, rather, rather curious since, as she says, if we're going to do this properly, this entails fundamental revisions in our curricula, then what kinds of fundamental revisions are we talking about? Who's going to make them and, 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 and how are they, what, are they, what are they going to look like? Now this drove me back, and again this is partly by accident, to thinking about the figure that all of the people who write about cosmopolitanism quote, which is Immanuel Kant. Uh, and uh, going back and uh, thinking about Immanuel Kant. Now, Immanuel Kant, uh, I'd long learned in the history of geography, of course, uh, he did stuff about geography. The interesting thing is that his, his geography has never been translated into English, and whenever I talk to any Kantian philosophers and that about the geography, I, they always kind of said, oh, it's not interesting, it's not worth bothering with, uh, you know, I mean, who would, you know, don't take it seriously, um, don't, don't, you know, so I was always sort of put off by this. Uh, I can't read German, but I can read French, and uh, just a couple of years ago, a French translation of the geography was brought out, and I, and I read it, and uh, I was shocked. It is the biggest load of gibberish you've ever come across in your whole life, and here's this incredible thinker systematically organizing knowledge in all sorts of ways who produces this text, which is absolutely appalling in terms of its, of its unsystematicity, its inability to, 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 to bring anything together in any kind of coherent way. Uh, worse still, it has in it all kinds of passages of the following sort. Humanity achieves its greatest perfection with the white race. The yellow Indians have somewhat less talent. The Negroes are much inferior, and some of the peoples of the Americas are well below them, by which I assume he means us. Um... And, and then he goes on to say things like, uh, you know, the Hottentots are, uh, are, are filthy and dirty and you could smell them from a long way away. The Javanese are thieving, idle, conniving people given to occasional fits of rage. And uh, uh, Burmese women lo love to wear outrageous clothing and get pregnant by, Euro by Europeans. I mean, it just goes on and on and on like this. It's, it's absolutely sort of uh, an appalling piece of, of, of literature. Now, far from dismissing this, I think it's important to look at this and say, well, actually, what's, what's going on here? And, 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 and how come uh, 
that a person who has universal ethics and, 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 and is deeply concerned with morality and deeply concerned with aesthetic judgments and all the rest of it can actually write this kind of stuff. Now, one of the arguments would be, of course, that he never took this seriously. But what you find out is that he taught geography 49 times in his life. It was not a trivial kind of thing for him. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm very committed to, 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 to Karl Marx. I'm not sure that I've taught that 49 times in my life. And after you've taught something 49 times, you should surely know something about it. <laughs> Although, you know, there are some people I kind of you wonder about. But <laughs> this is, but, but so he, and furthermore, when you read his, his, his programmatic writings, he takes the view that geographical and anthropological knowledges and historical knowledges as well are what he calls necessary preconditions for the discovery of all other forms of knowledge of the world, all other empirical forms of knowledge of the world. And, that, and furthermore, that geographical and anthropological and historical understandings are necessary preconditions for the application of all general knowledge to the world, all ethical principles to the world. So it, it actu actually, these knowledges, in his view, constitute a crucial mediating element in the whole structure of his, uh, of, of his understanding of knowledge in general, and also uh, a crucial mediating uh, position in the ways in which uh, knowledge is going to be um, uh, applied. So that Kant then uh, seems to me to raise a very specific kind of problem. If the geography of Kant is, 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 is roughly correct, uh, then you have the following difficulty. Either all the universal principles cannot possibly apply to all of the smelly Hottentots and the thieving Javanese because they haven't achieved yet a proper standard of, uh, of civilized behavior, or you apply those standards to those differential worlds in such a way as, of course, to come out with intensely prejudicial results. Uh, there is a sort of saying which I'm fond of using, which is, there is nothing more unequal than the equal treatment of unequals. So when you take an equality principle, an ethical principle, and you implant it upon this uneven world, then actually you create uh, even worse uh, inequalities than there were there before. So you're faced with those two choices. Now, lest you think that this is just a, a problem peculiar to Kant, I'd remind you that John Stuart Mill wrote his wonderful piece on representative government and then pronounced that this did not, however, apply to India because India had not yet achieved a sufficiently civilized state to, to have universal suffrage. I mean, and, and this actually is, is the whole history, actually, of liberal theory as it was applied to empire, which was part of the way in which the British Empire could follow liberal theory and utilitarian theory at home and believe this was central and through people like uh, John Stuart Mill at the same time act in totally authoritarian ways in places like India and throughout, throughout the, 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 the colonies. So this whole kind of habit is, 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 is deeply ingrained in, in certain Western ways of doing things, which suggests that the devil of the whole thing might lie in the geographical details that the way in which you set up the geography, of course, then mediates the universal ethical principles in such a way that you then have a certain right to behave in a certain part of the world in a certain kind of way, as if you're doing right when you're kind of saying, well, but geographically they're not part of us. Now, actually, if you look at the whole way in which U.S. foreign policy has operated, uh, what it typically does is, in the face of considerable geographical ignorance throughout uh, uh, the United States. It takes on particular spaces and territories of the global economy, typically demonizes them, turns them into, quote, rogue states or whatever, and then kind of says, therefore, we have a right uh, as uh, a, a civilizing mission, uh, as an ethical mission, uh, to go bomb the hell out of them or to discipline them in some way or other or put sanctions on them or something of this kind. So that actually what then frequently happens is that, you know, within the United States you'll find a general kind of feeling which came out very strongly after September the 11th that we're the good people, we're the good guys, we're okay, we, we, we have these wonderful principles which we deeply believe in, and indeed we do. Indeed we do. Nobody wants to challenge that. At least I would not want to challenge that. 
But when they get applied, they get applied in this differentiated world in such a way as to make the world much more unequal than it was before, and also to justify certain kinds of, of behaviours in relationship to the rest of, uh, of, of, of the world. Now, this creates an interesting kind of problem about how geographical knowledge is structured. And I came across a very interesting article in the New York Times which kind of said, you know, the more people know about a particular country, the less likely they are to support U.S. military action against that country or U.S. Uh, even U.S. sanctions against that, economic sanctions against that country. <coughs> and I thought, this is an interesting sort of survey, and I, and I mentioned it to a reporter from Reuters that I was talking to with, about issues of geography and so on. And the reporter from Reuters went off and tracked it down and found out, he said, well, this wasn't mentioned in the New York Times article, but actually this was a poll that was commissioned by Exxon. And I said, Exxon? <laughs> And he said, well, yeah, they want uh, the sanctions against Iran lifted so that they can get the oil flowing out of there freely. And they kind of figure better knowledge about Iran might be a good way to do, help do this, and that this is part of the, actually, this is a corporation saying, well, a certain kind of geographical knowledge can lead to a certain kind of political outcome, which is beneficial to us. And here you see the sort of chain of things operating. It is against, it's trying to persuade the U.S., to lift the sanctions, and it is, it is trying to do it via increasing certain kind of, of geographical knowledge. What is so interesting about what's been happening in Afghanistan is many of us have had a crash course on, on, on the geography of Afghanistan. And, we'll be, and, and the more we know about it, I think the less comfortable people start to feel with just carpet bombing the place. You know, I mean, what are we doing that? What, what, what's this for? I mean, why, you know, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to make sense. With, with the more more information we get about what is <laughs> what is what is there, who is there, and besides, you know, when we find out who the Northern Alliance is, we get less and less comfortable about supporting that lot uh, against the other lot. You know, and we recognise that we started the other lot anyway by what the CIA supported back in the, the sort of uh, the, the, the Mujahideen period. And so, the more we find out about this, the less comfortable we get with. With, uh, with what's going on. And one of the, I think, the encouraging things, which, by the way, differentiates something from what is happening now to what happened in, uh, around Vietnam, is it seems to me that, uh, at least in the circles I move in, knowledge of what is going on on the ground on Afghanistan is picking up a pace. People are asking the right kinds of questions. And I think that's very important as, a, as, a, as part, of, you know, part of the response to the U.S. policy in relationship to it is, 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 is better understanding of what exactly exists there and how it exists and, 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 and how to think of it. So I'm very interested then in that kind of political process which connects political power and the use of specific kinds of geographical knowledges for specific kinds of purposes. And so what I decided to do was to take a look at the various sites uh, which have produced geographical knowledges uh, over the years, and I'm not going to. Haven't got time to go over all of these. I have a long version of this paper. Uh, there's a short version in the last book I did, but there's a much longer version now. When you start to look at it, you see you see a number of different things occurring. For instance, you look at the way in which the state apparatus and even state formation has been connected to the production of certain kinds of geographical knowledge. There's no way in which nations could form without having a certain geographical imaginary of who they were, what they are. And actually, the whole one of the things you find with hanging maps on the wall and doing all those kinds of things, uh, a sort of whole kind of programmatic way of, 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 of nation formation and the formation of a certain geographical understanding, they went hand in hand. And it's not always clear what, what preceded what. And there are various stories to be told about this, and I think some very good studies uh, right now. There's a very good book called Mapping Siam, which talks about how uh, that country was sort of actually imagined geographically. It's a very good work by a Finnish geographer called Parsi. What he points out is that in the early 19th century, nobody in the place you call Finland knew they were in a place called Finland. They all thought they were, uh, as far as they were concerned, their world was in their commune and then neighboring communes and then a few connections with people who had, I don't know, migrated to the United States or gone somewhere else or were, were, in, were in Russia and, and, and that was their world. 
and it took about 40 or 50 years of hard work by sort of uh, uh, ethnographers, musicologists, uh, literary people, geographers to sort of uh, actually try to convince people that they lived in this thing called Finland. And by the end of the century, most people would kind of say, yeah, they were Finnish, and they could understand what that meant, and hanging those maps on the wall and educating people in this. So nation-state formation was from the very get-go a kind of a geographical enterprise, and it involved the production of certain kinds of geographical knowledge, and it rested upon certain kinds of geographical understandings. Geographical understandings, which, by the way, were rather different in kind from some of the others which the state subsequently produced. It was a geographical understanding which was very much about affection, about, mo um, about, about emotion, about belonging, about loving. And, and it was invoking a lot of these kinds of territorial uh, connections, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Welsh and their mountains or the, the, the you know, the, 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 the Germans and their forests and, and those, those kinds of things. So the whole kind of uh, there's a sort of romantic uh, side of, uh, of, of this, which was also crucially important. But once the state is formed, it starts then to actually produce a different kind of geographical knowledge. It needs an objective kind of geographical knowledge in order to govern. So the whole issue of governmentality then arises, and so you start to get censuses, you start to get uh, sort of property rights surveys, administrative districts set up, all of the collection of objective kinds of information. Soon the state is fragmenting into, you know, the, the transport department versus the fisheries versus the agriculture versus the, uh, the social security. And so you start to find the state apparatus is producing vast, vast amounts of, uh, of uh, geographical information, which is all codified in a very objective kind of way. So you get a kind of an objective uh, geographical knowledge, which is then produced as part of the governmentality of the state apparatus. But then you'll find also within the state apparatus certain kinds of needs which become very dominant. For instance, the military. Now, there's been a long history of the relationship between production of certain kinds of geographical knowledge and the military apparatus. This has gone on since the Greeks and the Romans. But what you will, what you will find is in places like France, it was the uh, uh, Corps of Engineers and, the, 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 and, and, uh, and that that was, was really producing a lot of the geographical knowledge which was, which was precisely about military control and about uh, the digging of fortifications and about the organ organization of, uh, of, of military strategies. And interestingly, when, uh, when I was a student, many of the things we had to do as a student were around um, you know, we were giving exercises like a tank weighs so much and here are these different soil patterns, find the optimal path for the tank so it doesn't stick in the mud en route between this place and that place, you know, and you kind of felt what were you supposed to do, sort of imitate general pattern racing across Europe and finding the right kind of path, but those are the kinds of exercises uh, we did and we very, very closely, very close connection and it's interesting that in this country, uh, uh, Annapolis and uh, West Point uh, have uh, uh, geography departments and they don't uh, give them up um, as some other institutions have, uh, have done because it's an important part of how military power is going to be con constructed. But then there's some other interesting things like geopolitically. How, does a, how, does a, how, how do nation states start to organize themselves and orchestrate knowledge geopolitically about the rest of the world, their positionality in the rest of the world? If you consider yourself in a Darwinian struggle with the rest of the world, then you start to con constitute everybody out there as being sort of others, nasty people, you know, and all the rest of it, uh, like the British do with the French uh, uh, periodically, and the Germans with the French and all the rest of it, you know. <coughs> you get that kind of uh, hostility uh, which, uh, which, uh, which, which gets set up in, in, in that kind of way. But then there's a kind of another kind of knowledge which gets structured around the notion of empire. And I think this is actually rather interesting because if you really want to manage an empire well, then you have to know something about it in all kinds of dimensions. And actually, imperial knowledges have a rather different structure from nation-state knowledges. Imperial knowledges tend to, geographical knowledges tend to, to, to think about how to, uh, 
I had to co-opt how to integrate, uh, ha have a certain empathy with uh, indigenous populations, how to uh, sort of uh, manage the native according to the native's own terms, and uh, th therefore means that you need a, a sympathetic anthropologist or a sympathetic geographer to go in there and understand some of the social relationships and talk about how to, uh, how to, how to manage those. But insofar as it does that, then it produces a certain tension in the center. Um, and the tension in the center is that people who know what's going on on the ground out there may come back to the center and say, well, I think you have fundamentally flawed policies in the center. Uh, if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, the way in which many of the French uh, intelligentsia uh, responded to Algerian independence movement uh, in the, in the post-war post period, you find many people had had actually experience on the ground of what it was, what it was like out there and, and, and went against the politics of the metropole. Uh, in this country, I'd, I'd love to see a study of what happened to people uh, over the years who've been in the Peace Corps. Many of them have gone out with sort of attitudes which uh, do good as from America, got there on the ground, discovered all kinds of things uh, on the ground out there that were very surprising to them and have actually become quite strong critics of some of uh, U.S. Uh, certain aspects of U.S. Foreign, foreign, foreign policy. So the management of empire, insofar as it, it, it often involves this sort of tension between the metropole and what is being managed out there, and, and that tension uh, sometimes erupts in the nature of the, of, of, of the geographical knowledge uh, being constructed. So the nation-state, the imperial presence, the military and so on, is a vast arena of knowledge production. Uh, professional geographers, of course, often been involved in that and very close to it. And insofar as they've been so, they have become agents of state power, agents of military power, agents of colonial power, and the like. And I'm not saying there's anything particularly wrong with that, but what I want to say is that as an academic uh, institution, geography has been s seriously hemmed in by its attachments to the state apparatus and the various roles that have existed within the state apparatus. It's gained certain strengths from it, but it's also, I think, uh, uh, had, had some serious problems with it. Now, if you go further, I'm not going to go through all of the different, different sites of, of knowledge production, but I basically wanted to contrast uh, two particular sites. One uh, would be some of the supranational institutions. Uh, let's look at something like the World Bank. The World Bank has been uh, a major agent for the production of, uh, of geographical knowledge since uh, the 1950s, 19, early 1960s in particular. Its, it's uh, data collection, its uh, reports and so on have been you know, very serious uh, documents which uh, collect information in a certain kinds of way around the issues in this, in this case of a, some kind of notion of global governance under the hegemony of, uh, of dominance of US, uh, of US uh, economic and military power. So the World Bank, however, had a certain geographical vision. And it, was, and it was very interesting. In the 1960s, 1970s, it basically viewed the world as being carved up into these things called nation states. They were newly formed nation states. Each nation state was going to have its own trajectory of economic development. It was going to go through various stages of economic development defined by uh, Rostow in his famous book on stages of economic growth. And, there were, and the, the task of the World Bank was, was, was to help each state go through uh, the takeoff into economic growth, which would then lead each state into an era of mass consumption, which would then defend the world against the incursions of communism. Um, Rostow's book, uh, by the way, had a title of the Non-Communist Manifesto, so it was very explicit in terms of its Cold War uh, ideology. Now, the trouble with this, of course, is that a lot of the, 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 the decolonized states were sort of rather incoherent entities in terms of either their, you know, there were states in search of a nation in many instances, and they had no nation to, 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 to turn to. They were, they were, and, and in many cases, they didn't even make ecological sense. They made, made sort of administrative sense for the, uh, for, for, for the, for the empires that had once uh, carved them up, but they made, they made very little sense in terms of what Rostow was, uh, was, 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 was talking about, as some sort of coherent economic entity. Many of them were not coherent economic entities at all.
So you find that this this model of uh, of, uh, of economic development was was predicated on a certain way of understanding the world. Now, the last issue of the World Bank had a rather different way of understanding the world. Its geography was rather different. To begin with, resources which had been in the earlier thing and seen as something just to be used in cause of economic development has been replaced by the category of environment. And the environment is seen as something which is very much more complicated and it's uh, and, and that therefore there's sort of an eco ecology that needs to be uh, pay, paid attention to. And the World Bank has a whole bunch of people working for it on environmental kinds of issues. Furthermore, the bank now recognizes it's not only the state apparatus that's important, the civil, something called civil society is also important. It has to negotiate with various elements of civil society. It has to recognize status of women. It has to recognize status of various social movements. It can work through social movements better in some instances than it can work through government, so that actually starts to talk about uh, those sorts of issues. It also recognizes that nation-state boundaries are highly porous and that therefore it should be very interested in sort of regional compacts and trying to force regional alliances around Around certain kinds, uh, around certain kinds of development projects. So, the World Bank's geographical vision has actually changed dramatically from 1960 to now, and and insofar as it's changed dramatically, the question arises: Well, why has it changed dr so dramatically? Uh, two reasons. One is uh, the old model failed rather dismally and uh, and was seen to be failing, and so they needed to do something rather different. Uh, secondly, they also moved from a state-based, you know, sort of Keynesian state-based uh, philosophy to a, a, a sort of neoliberal market-based uh, philosophy. But then in addition to that, the World Bank, of course, was subject to fierce criticism. And it was subject to fierce criticism from a, a wide range of, of quarters, uh, particularly the NGOs. And uh, not only the NGOs, but uh, uh, other organizations which had uh, some, some importance, uh, like the church and, 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 and the like. And what is interesting is to look at the way in which some of those criticisms were set up. The World Bank would describe a dam in some part of the world as some sort of uh, wonderful modern intervention which is going to deliver benefits to everybody. Uh, and, and it was like it was being inserted into this sort of rather empty space as if nothing was there beforehand. And it was going to do these wonderful things for people in the future. Uh, Greenpeace said, that's not what it's like at all. This is the imposition of something. Uh, from on high, in, and it's an insertion into an ecological kind of context, which is in some instances highly destructive of, uh, of how the ecology is, is, is functioning and how the ecology is working. It's also uh, disrespectful of uh, indigenous rights and indigenous populations, and, and, and so actually the, the, the geographical picture that you get from the World Bank sort of report is completely different from the way in which uh, Greenpeace would describe what's there. And interestingly, if you believe what Greenpeace says is there, then you'd find the World Bank policy seriously flawed. And from that standpoint, part of the battle which Greenpeace raised was ra specifically raised was a battle over, well, what kind of geographical information are you com conveying here? What kind of geographical picture are you conjuring up as to what is happening in this space, what is happening in this place, who is there, what is there, what needs to be done, and how it should be done? And you will find innumerable instances of this kind. For instance, if you looked at the way in which uh, the U.S. was intervening in Central America uh, in the sort of uh, late 70s, uh, early 80s. Uh, you would get all this sort of propaganda stuff that came from, from the State Department, which would kind of have a map of Central America, and it would have Cuba colored red. And then all of a sudden, El Salvador would go red. And then Nicaragua would go red. And then Guatemala would go red. And then uh, the one I really liked was when Mexico went red, and then Texas went red. <laughs> and you, you know, you know, and, and he's got this sort of crude geographical vision which kind of said this is a geopolitical struggle in which Cuba is trying to assert its influence and the Soviet is behind it and that's, that's all that's going on here. Then you would read something like Oxfam reports on what is going on on the ground and you'd find a, 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 a minute attention to all kinds of things like land ownership, structures of, of, uh, of what was happening in terms of the forcing of, of uh, low-income populations off the land 
off the fertile land onto very marginal land where they could no longer make a living with it, with the uh, with their traditional methods of agriculture, and they had to become uh, sort of wage laborers and uh, and as such poorly paid and grossly exploited, and all the social inequalities that went with that. So you're reading an Oxfam report, and you'd say this is a completely different world from the one which I'm hearing from the State Department and the one that I'm hearing from 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 the the, the, the CIA. And so part here too, the battle uh, over what, what should happen in Central America was a battle over trying to understand what it was that was going on on the ground. The church organizations were extremely good about bringing back all kinds of information about what is going on on the ground. They too had a certain, a certain geographical knowledge which they were bringing into the situation. And as soon as that filtered into the situation, it changed uh, the political picture of, of the way in which uh, many people uh, started to think. So, so this contrast then of uh, is, is, seems to me absolutely crucial to understand. Now, what I want to do here then is to say, look, there are all kinds of sites uh, which produce geographical knowledge, and they produce geographical knowledge of a certain sort for their own specific purposes. And when you look at those different kinds of sites, what you start to see is the production of a certain kind of knowledge which is, is, is facilitative of certain things, but also erases all kinds of other things. And if you look at the way in which, say, commerce is producing a certain kind of understand, geographical understanding of the world, how, how multinational corporations are working. If you look at ha some of, of the financial newspapers, for example, I, I, I'm a great fan uh, of the Financial Times. I think it's one of the best uh, places to get good geographical information of a certain limited sort. But if you want accurate information of that sort, then the Financial Times is a good place to get it because the Financial Times recognizes that business people need good geographical information in order to make decisions, and they are out there uh, struggling to, to, to get it. You won't find much about sort of, except in the sort of reverse form in terms of uh, labor rights, uh, or uh, you will find stuff about that, but it's usually, of course, written from the, from the alternative perspective. But so there are, there are these vast sources of geographical information. Another one of my favorite ones is, of course, the tourist industry. Just think how the tourist industry is producing certain geographical imaginaries and what it's about. I mean, they're not interested in uh, sort of producing geographies of social distress or the geography of class struggle or, 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 or the geography of of uh, ethnic violence and, and, and all the rest of it. What they are interested in doing is presenting you with some sort of sanitized view of the world, which is, you know, sort of about there's something sort of uh, vaguely erotic out there to be had. It's sort of uh, sex and sun and sea and sand and, 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 and all kinds of things like that. So it produces, it produces a certain kind of uh, imaginary. Now, the point about this is that to the degree that people believe that imaginary, to the p degree that the people believe that that is how the geography of the world is, then, of course, people start to behave uh, in relationship to that. And, of course, they get very severely uh, disappointed on, a, on occasion. There's this wonderful comment from, this is from the other, another perspective, a wonderful comment of somebody who, who went off to, to Europe. This is an uh, American student who went off to Europe and then came back and was interviewed when they came back and said she really thought that... Uh, um, Europe was, 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 was terrible compared to Disney World. And she says, she says, at Disney World, all the countries are much closer together. <laughs> and they show you the best of each country. Europe is boring. People talk strange languages and things are dirty. Sometimes you don't see anything interesting in Europe for days. But at Disney World, something happens all the time and people are happy. It's much more fun. It's well designed. <laughs> now... This, this would not be a, a, such a tragic uh, comment if it weren't for the fact that a lot of European cities are, of course, trying to redesign themselves to Disney standards. Because if that's the way in which people think, then what do you do? You, 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 you clean up the dirt. Uh, you, know, you, you make everybody learn English. Uh, you, 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 uh, uh, you actually uh, start to design the city so that people can... can get around and you, you put in all the boutiques and all those kinds of things and, and you actually invent traditions at a very fast rate. So here is a situation where a certain geographical imaginary is not just simply, it's not just sort of in innocent in relationship to the world, it also has incredible effects in exactly the same way that U.S. foreign policy has incredible effects upon things. What the tourist industry 
invents in the imagination then has, curious, has all sorts of effects in terms of, of actually how geographies get produced. So we're not only talking about the production of knowledge, we're also talking about the active production of, uh, of, of new geographical uh, configurations uh, on the ground. Now, these arguments I'm, I'm, I'm making uh, would then say, well, look, uh, there are a vast areas uh, of production of geographical knowledge in the tourist industry, in the, ma in the media, in the press, uh, in uh, multinational corporations, uh, in the banking industry, in the state apparatus, uh, vast areas of production of geographical knowledge. And these geographical knowledges uh, have a very important role to play in exactly how those institutions act. Now, in saying it this way, I don't want to pretend that, that necessarily all of those institutions produce uh, geographical knowledge which is exactly you know, right for their purpose. In fact, many of them work with, with rather bad geographical knowledge. I mean, you know, we've seen the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade is a sort of a, just one sort of, sort of spectacular example of, of uh, the wrong geographical knowledge, although some people figure it was a deliberate mistake, for, so I don't know about that. But so, so, and, and there are many inst situations.